Hi, this is Pastor Daryl Myatt from Keller, Texas. Today is Wednesday, May 10th, 2017. This channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, I had a great visit in California. got to see my buddy Kevin. And yes, of course, at some point the conversation did turn to God. Um, <laughs> I will not give up on my buddy. I will continue to tell him about my Lord and Savior, just like I do as many people as possible. Anyway, let's get right into it today. Uh, this first story comes out of the New York Post. It says, Anonymous warns world to prepare for World War III. Now, I know you're going to hear a lot of things like this, especially with the things going on in the world. Uh, but understand something. Jesus said there would be wars and rumors of wars. Uh, but the end is not yet. You know, famines, earthquakes in various places, pestilence. Um, then continues to tell us other things that will happen prior to his return. You know, many will be offended. The love of many will grow cold. There will be false Christ, false teachers, false prophets. A lot of deception. We're seeing all these things even now. The infamous hacktivist group, Anonymous, has released a new video urging people across the globe to prepare for World War III as the U.S. and North Korea continue to move strategic pieces into place for battle. All the signs of a looming war on the Korean Peninsula are surfacing, the group says in this six-minute video. Um, uh, it came over on YouTube, and they're talking about military movement in a lot of places. Watching as... Puzzle pieces put into place. There's going to be wars, ground troops. The battle's likely to be fierce, brutal, and quick. It'll be globally devastating, both on the environment and economical levels. Okay, well, you know, the Bible speaks of a war that wipes out a third of mankind that emanates from the Euphrates River area. Uh, that's found in Revelation 9, right? Revelation 9. Uh, let's see, yes, Revelation 9, right there about uh, verse 14, one third part of men, the third part of men will be destroyed. If that happened today, there's over 7 billion people on the planet, so that would be some 2.5 billion people would lose their lives. Here's Anonymous telling us World War III is coming. I think the Bible's pretty clear. There's going to be wars before the return of Christ. So this is really nothing new, but we see it knocking on the door even now. Out of Israel National News, Benjamin Netanyahu says every country should move their embassy to Jerusalem. I'm wondering what's going to happen when Donald Trump goes to Israel later this month. I think he's going to have a surprise announcement. Well, it won't be that big of a surprise for those of us who are watching and waiting. Um, I think he will recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital and announce that he's moving the embassy there. Benjamin Netanyahu says every country should move their embassy to Jerusalem, starting with America. Out of the Jerusalem Post, Turkey's president says, we will protect against the Judaization of Jerusalem. First of all, I have to comment about that statement, Judaizing Jerusalem. Okay, let me just point out that Jerusalem is Jewish. It's been the capital of the Jewish people for more than 3,000 years. Okay, by comparison, Washington, D.C. has only been the capital of the American people for some 240 years. Okay, versus more than 3,000. Jerusalem is Jewish. Saying that you'll protect against the Judaization of Jerusalem is like saying you're going to protect against the Americanization of Texas. Okay, it's American. It'll look like America. Okay, it's like saying you're going to protect against the Chinese uh, uh, building of the China, Great Wall of China. You're going to protect against the Islamization of... Uh, the mosque. Come on. Really? Because Jerusalem is Jewish. 
Turkish president vowed his government would work with the Palestinian people to guard against the Judaization of Jerusalem. Wow. Just amazing to me how much the world hates Israel. You know, the Bible spoke about this, saying that all the world would come against Jerusalem. Also understand something that the Bible tells us, that God will fight against those nations that fight against Israel. Or, no, it says Jerusalem specifically. Uh, let me go to it real quick, just to confirm. Zechariah 12, verse 9, I believe it is. Yes, and in that, and it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. God's word's pretty clear. You want to fight against Jerusalem? You're going to fight against God. Period. That's what the Bible says. So you might want to watch out what you think or how you feel about Jerusalem because God will fight those who fight against Jerusalem. I don't know if you know this, but you can't defeat God. There's no way. There's no way. She might want to get on the winning team. Times of Israel. Erdogan lashes racist Israel, calls for Muslims to flood the Temple Mount. It's so amazing to me that Jews and Christians can't pray on the Temple Mount, yet Muslims can go play soccer and have picnics and and spit and do all kinds of things. They can, they can gather rocks and fire bombs to throw down on Jews and Christians. And they say it's the third holiest place to them, yet they treat it like you'd treat a rental car. To the Jews, it's the holiest place in the world. The reason it's the holiest place is because King David bought it, and they built the first and second temples there. Abraham nearly sacrificed his son Isaac on this very same temple, Mount, Mount Moriah. Jesus actually spoke in the second temple. He drove out the money changers that were there for the wrong reasons. Here's Turkey's president calling for Muslims to flood the Temple Mount. He warns against the United States moving their embassy to Jerusalem. Wow. Just amazing. The president of Israel, out of Ynet News, Reuven Rivlin, uh, Reuven Rivlin, Rivlin, said, we will continue to ensure freedom of religion for all religions and believers. Uh, he, he's slamming the remarks made by Turkey's president and said that we have heard statements attacking Israel for building a Jewish life in Jerusalem. In the past 150 years, there's been a Jewish majority in the city, even under the Ottoman Empire. Under Jewish sovereignty, we have continued to build and establish Jerusalem, the eternal capital of the Jewish people. There's no doubt that Jerusalem is a microcosm of our ability to live together. We will continue to ensure freedom of religion for all religions and believers. He doesn't single out Muslims, say, oh yeah, you can't worship here. Yet the Muslims say to the Jews and Christians, yeah, you can't pray on the Temple Mount. In fact, this isn't yours. You have nothing to do with it. It's funny that Jerusalem is kind of the, the well, I don't want to say home to the world's three biggest religions. Abraham could be pointed to as the father of all three religions, Jew, uh, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, okay? Because all three of them came from there. Abraham is considered to be the father of the Jews, you know, because if you read in Matthew 1, you kind of read the genealogy from Abraham through several generations down to King David, several more generations down to Jesus. And it's because of Abraham and his wife Sarah that we had Isaac, who is the covenant promised to that all nations would be blessed in him through Isaac's bloodline. We get Jesus Christ, Christianity. Through Ishmael, who... Abraham, with his wife's Egyptian slave girl, Hagar, they had Ishmael, and he became the father of Arabs and Muslims. So we have Islam through Ishmael, Abraham's son, and we also have uh, Judaism, obviously. King David was a Jew. Jesus was a Jew. 
that's the reason the Jews are the chosen people, because God brought the Savior of the world, the Messiah, through the Jewish bloodline. Very interesting. Um, it's all going to come together. Out of the Algeminer, Moscow official says, Israel has promised to do everything possible to avoid harming Russian troops in Syria. Very interesting that Israel and Russia are working side by side to make sure that they don't harm each other in Syria. You know, I'm convinced in Ezekiel 38 and Ezekiel 39 that Iran leads this world army against Israel. I believe Russia is right there beside Iran as this happens. Of course, we know that Israel burns the enemy's weapons for seven years. And I don't know of many weapons that can burn that long other than nuclear weapons. Interesting times we live in, people. Out of Free Beacon, Iran to launch two new satellites likely cover for illicit ICBM program. Trump administration moving closer to confronting the Iranian threat. Wow, so North Korea, Iran. You know, we know both of those countries have friends. China's very good friends with North Korea. Of course, Russia being very good friends with Iran. If America takes on North Korea and Iran, you think China and Russia might not step into this whole thing? And let me remind you too, you know, some people like to say, oh, Daryl, you're a warmonger. You're pushing for war. No, I'm not. I'm giving you facts on the ground. The Bible tells us there's going to be war and rumors of war. I'm not promoting war. I'm promoting the very fact that Christ is the only way you can be saved. That's the real message of what I bring you every day, Monday through Friday. Jesus Christ is the only name under heaven by which you must be saved. God doesn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind, we're told in 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. So if this kind of news makes you afraid, then you might want to reevaluate who it is you trust. Because I trust God, and no matter what my plan might be, I know His is better, His is greater, and I'm going to trust Him. I'm going to trust God. You know, if it just so happens that his plan involves taking me out of here through some kind of war or something, so be it. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Okay, so honestly, this is not my home. And <laughs> if I'm going to be going home, that's fine with me. Uh, but until then, I have work to do, and so do you. We have more lost souls to lead to the cross of Christ. Hopefully Christ will find us faithfully serving him when he returns. Out of the Christian headlines, Navy SEAL dies defending Iraqi Christian town from ISIS. A U.S. Navy SEAL was killed while defending a Christian town from an attack by Islamic State militants. This young man was killed. There was five American soldiers helping out to fight against ISIS in, in Iraq. His friend said he was a real American hero. He was taken out by a sniper. Defending Christians against those who don't know God. Here's a little tidbit for you out of the Washington Times. Trump's immigration enforcement helped slow illegal border crossings by 76%. Say what you want about Donald Trump. He's cut down on the illegal immigration. Now, I'm all for people coming to America, but there's a right way. There's a legal way to do so. I mean, if you think about it, we're all immigrants, mostly, except for my native brothers and sisters. Of course, I have some of that blood in me also. Here's an interesting story out of Breaking Israel News. 2,000 years ago, Prophet Nehemiah performed this temple rite to revive sacrifices. Now the Sanhedrin is reviving it. 
In Nehemiah 1 verse 9 out of the Israel Bible, it says, But if you return unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though your dispersed were in the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them into the place that I have chosen to cause my name to dwell there. On the first, on the day after the Feast of, uh, feast of Weeks, the Sanhedrin will reenact a ceremony officially establishing the borders of Jerusalem for purposes of reinstating the temple service. Wow. This news just kind of snuck right in there and nobody really gave it much thought. The last time this was performed was performed by Nehemiah in the 6th century before Christ, more than 2,600 years ago. This was the final step before beginning the sacrifices, but today this is looked at and known as a very powerful and timely political statement. Wow, you realize the Sanhedrin has been reestablished in this day and age, right? The Sanhedrin established the borders is probably the final step in reinstating temple service. Right after Nehemiah reestablished the boundaries of Jerusalem, the sacrifices started all over again. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Very interesting. Uh, a lot of things happening in legal matters with Christians. There's a group called the ACLJ, not to be confused with the ACLU. The ACLJ is the um, American, oh goodness, what's it stand for? American Christian for Law and Justice. Um, American Center for Law and Justice. It's a Christian law protection. I mean, they're Christian lawyers fighting against injustice. Uh, they're fighting religious liberty on campuses in America right now. Uh, they're taking major action in federal appeals court to defend the faith of Christian students from anti-Christian discrimination. One state college rejected a Christian student saying the medical field is not the place for religion. In another case, a college student was denied admission because he brought up religion. See, anti-Christian discrimination is growing in America. One university student was expelled for her faith. Another one was told to defile the name of Jesus. Another one was failed for refusing to agree that Christianity is false. You know, this is unconstitutional. The Constitution is very clear. Believing in God does not disqualify a student from academic study in any field. Anti-Christian discrimination. Right here in America. God told us this would happen. Let's go to Ruth. Ruth 3, starting in verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? Naomi, right here, gives an example of how we should handle life and what we should do when life becomes difficult. See, right here in the midst of her depression, she did something that helped her get out from under this dark cloud of bitterness and anger that she was living in. Naomi stopped thinking about herself and started thinking about someone else. Now, I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know what you're going through. But I can tell you this. If you're down, if you're depressed, if you're looking for that long-lost joy, I think you need to listen. If you can step outside of yourself and start to serve others, I think you'll find that depression, that dark cloud will start to ease. It'll begin to lift off of you. If you're discouraged, if you're in a place of bitterness or loneliness or depression, I'd like to encourage you to get interested in serving others. Okay? Get involved in your church. Um, adopt a family. Or find a child that you can share a gift with. Do something kind, a random act of kindness that you could not be repaid for. And watch what happens. 
Uh, I think it's important that we share our faith. Nothing, I think, quite lifts your spirits and brings joy to your heart like sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with someone who really needs to hear it. I think when you're discouraged or depressed or down in the dumps, the best thing you can do is set your mind on Jesus Christ. Worship him. Look to him. Speak to him. Open your Bible. Ask the Spirit of God to, to mend your broken heart. And then ask for God to lead you to someone else you can bless. And then when you do, just watch God restore your joy. Watch him replenish and refresh your spirit like nothing else has. We need to learn how to develop a godly lifestyle. In Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This, this verse tells us how to develop a, a godly lifestyle. You know, Paul was telling believers not to be conformed to the patterns of this world. I think a lot of us compromise a lot of things in this world. And I think it's one of the greatest dangers of God-fearing believers today. I mean, through these ungodly relationships that we have, and the impact of the media, TV, film, radio, internet, we're being influenced by people who aren't following God's ways, who don't even know God in many instances. Our society tells us to put ourselves first. Take what we want. What's in it for me? Do it my way. Protect our rights. Promote our interests above everyone else's. But by contrast, Jesus said that our Heavenly Father is going to provide what we truly need. Philippians 4, verse 19. And that we are to deny ourselves and take up our cross daily and follow Him. Luke 9, verse 23. And the humble, not the proud, will receive honor. James 4, verse 10. Conforming to the world's ideals leads us away from God. This is not our home. We're not of this world. Jesus said so himself. They are not of this world. Neither am I of this world. Paul urges us to pursue godly transformation of our mind, to set our thoughts on things above, Colossians 3, verse 2, and to focus what is right, true, and pure, and lovely, Philippians 4, verse 8. So if we have a, a Christian worldview, it'll lead us to be more like Christ. It requires, I think, making adjustments on how we look at life, how we look at the world, um, until our thoughts line up with Scripture, until God helps mold us and make us and shape us more into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. We have to protect our minds with biblical truth so we won't be deceived and led astray by lies. We need to surround ourselves with mature believers who can warn us when we start to stray a little bit. So are you focusing what's important to the Lord? Are you avoiding compromise? Are you making it a conscious effort to adhere to all biblical truth and discount worldly lies? Are you demonstrating a pattern of, of Christ-like transformation? You know what? Ask the Holy Spirit to fill you, to guide you, and to help you make the necessary changes so you can be more and more like Jesus Christ. In Matthew 12, 43, it says, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walks through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. You know, a lot of times these verses are used to teach about demonic possession and deliverance from evil spirits. Jesus made it pretty clear that getting rid of an unclean spirit is only part of a deliverance. You have to fill that place that was previously occupied by the demonic spirit with the presence and power of God as protection against these demonic spirits. You know, if a person is cleansed from an evil spirit but's left empty, that spirit will return with even more spirits and the individual will be much worse off than they were before. Simply getting rid of the devil but not being filled with God is a very dangerous condition and probably very short-lived. True and real deliverance is not only getting free, 
but staying free. You see, in context of these verses, this is referring to Jesus rebuking the scribes and Pharisees and his statement about the men of, of uh, Nineveh and the Queen of the South condemning them at the judgment. I mean, one of the laws of God concerning accountability is being dealt with right here in this passage. Uh, Luke 12, 48, For unto whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required. See, the people of Jesus' day who rejected his message are going to be held more accountable at the judgment than the men of Nineveh or the Queen of Sheba because the witness of Jesus Christ himself and the person of Christ was so much greater than either Jonah or Solomon. You know, just as a man who receives some kind of divine, miraculous deliverance from an evil spirit becomes more accountable and will end up in even worse condition if he doesn't walk in that accountability, so too the people of Jesus' generation were accountable for more than any other generation had ever been. Does that make sense? I mean, a person would be better off to keep just one evil spirit than to be set free and not be filled with God and wind up with eight demonic spirits, seven of which were probably more wicked than the first one. The scribes and Pharisees would have been better off to have never had Jesus bring the kingdom of God unto them than to reject such an offer. They had the Son of God, God in flesh, the Messiah that was prophesied and the Savior of the world standing right in front of them, yet they thought they were more holy than he. That's some foolishness and arrogant pride right there. Has God given you a lot? Of whom much has been given, much will be required. Um, keep that in mind. Jesus said in John 16, verse 33, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In the world you shall have tribulation. Do you wonder why God would do such a thing? You ever look up to the Heavenly Father and you see he's perfect and righteous and pure and just and holy? Don't you know that one day <laughs> we're going to be like him? We're going to be less like this and more like Christ. How easy is it going to be to transform this sinful, wicked flesh into the perfect image of God. Don't you know it's going to require a lot of refining in the furnace to remove impurities? To remove the wickedness and the corruptions of our heart? To make us perfect even as our Heavenly Father is perfect? Look beneath you. Do you not know that your enemies are beneath your feet? We were once servants of Satan. Do you think any king is willingly ready to let go of his former subjects? You think Satan's going to leave you alone? You think he's going to say, oh, well, he went over to the, the light side. He went over to the light of truth, so I'll just leave him alone now. Think he's not going to hound you every day and night until you see Christ? He goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, stealing and killing and destroying. So we need to expect trouble. Even when we look beneath our feet and our enemies are there, look around you. Where are you? We're in the enemy's country. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4 makes this quite plain when it tells us 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Satan's a liar. He's lying to people, keeping the glorious truth of Christ from entering into their hearts. The God of this world. This is the devil's territory. 
This is not my home. We're strangers passing through. We're aliens. Like Abraham said, this world is not our friend. It's a friend to the devil. And it's going to become more and more clear the closer we get to the return of Christ. If the world is your friend, then you're not God's friend according to Scripture. For he who's a friend of the world is an enemy of God. This is biblical. I know, it's very difficult. There's a lot of things we like here, isn't there? But we cannot conform to the patterns of this world, but we have to renew our minds to be more like God. You'll find enemies all over the place, all throughout this world. When you sleep, you're just resting on the battlefield. Okay? When you walk, we should anticipate an ambush everywhere we turn. Be alert. Be aware. You know, it's said mosquitoes bite strangers more than they bite natives. So probably the trials of this earth will be hardest on those who are not of this world. Look within. Look within your heart. See what's there. Sin, wickedness, greed, lust, self. Ah, even if we had no devil to tempt us, no demons to make us turn from God, no enemies to fight, no world to snare us, we would still find enough evil within ourselves with plenty of trouble because the Bible is very clear, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So we need to expect trouble. We need to expect tribulation. But don't despair because of it. Because God is with us. He will strengthen you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He has said, I will be with thee in trouble. I will deliver thee and honor thee. Understand something. Nothing or no one can snatch you out of the Father's hand. So, don't resist the fires of tribulation, because most of the time they're there to help remove impurities, to make us more and more like Christ. <laughs> I don't know about you, but... I could probably spend many years in the fires removing impurities. God has a lot of work to do with those who seek to serve him. So expect trials, expect troubles, expect tribulation. But know this, that God is always with you. And whatever God brings you to, he will bring you through. Trust him always. Today tomorrow, and forever. God bless you guys. Good Lord willing, I'll see you again tomorrow.